The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Remote Work Policies and Considerations, presented by our sponsor, Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Amanda Ramatar, and I will be your moderator today. And I'll also be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up this session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discussed can be found at the URL currently showing on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. We do not control the audio, your devices control the audio. So if you have audio difficulties, try adjusting the volume settings on your device. If a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you're using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond. Or we may follow up with an email if we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to eight, 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout and the presenters will be answering questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number of upcoming webinars covering a variety of topics, including those listed at the Heffernan web webinar website. In addition, we offer the mandatory preventing harassment training in English three times a year. With that, let's begin today's webinar, Remote Work Policies and Considerations. CJ Westbrook has been in human resources management for over 25 years and received her Senior Professional in Human Resources National Certification in 2002. She started HR Jungle in 2006 and targets companies that want senior level HR expertise on a part-time basis. HR Jungle provides business owners and management teams workable solutions and hands-on assistance with employees and legal compliance through outsourced HR services. Thank you for being with us today, TJ. Let me turn the screen over to you, hang on. Go. Hi, CJ, are you there? I am, can you hear me? Yeah, um, we're seeing a couple of screens, so. Ah, wrong one then. All right, hold on, hold on. I think what I'm gonna do is we turn that one off. Are we down to one screen? Oops. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, I can hear you. Um, currently, we're looking at. Okay, so yes. There we go. We've got one screen now. Okay, let me get the presentation back up. All right. One screen. Everybody can hear me, right? Loud and clear. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, we're talking about remote work and uh, the topics we're going to include in there are the effects that COVID has had on that, some myths versus reality, policy considerations, HR issues, and a few tips for success. And I'm going to jump right into our first polling question. What percentage of remote workers did you have in 2019? We're looking for the number before COVID. Anyone there? 
that participation definitely makes it much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> almost 80% coming in here. All right, I can close that poll. Oops, and it looks like the results were 52% were 0%, 20% were about 25%, and then 11% were 75%, and 8% were 100%. All right. And I think we all know that COVID forced a lot of remote work in organizations that didn't previously have it. And I will say in 2020, it felt like it was a band-aid job. I mean, I had clients that were dropping off, you know, tables at their employees' homes in order to have them be able to have a table height that was good for computers and things like that. Um, it was just anything anybody could do to keep the business flowing. And so it's changed a lot. I mean, you know, the statistics show that 37%, 37% of all jobs could be done remotely before COVID, and only 7% actually worked remotely. But during COVID, you know, as I mentioned, everybody was doing whatever they could to keep the work going. People were trying to work from home for better or worse. Some of it didn't work out so great, but we've now changed. And now 30% of employees consider themselves hybrid. Hybrid means that they're partially working in the office, partially from home. And 35% of employees um, are working entirely remotely. And I won't be surprised to see some of those numbers go up, but I think it's gonna move around a little bit. And so now let's see what you were doing before COVID. Let's see what you're doing today with this next polling question. What percentage of your employees are working remotely today? Interesting to see the change over time. Definitely. definitely well, I know a lot of companies have adapted and decided to stay, you know, have a lot more employees stay remote. And, right. But there's been pluses and minuses to that thought process. Definitely. Okay, we've got about 75% who voted. Almost <clears throat> at 80. Okay. All right, so I think that we've got enough votes in. And the results are 5% uh, are 0%, 20% are 25%, 23% are 50%, 32% are 75%, and 21% are 100%. So everyone can see how heavily it's moved into the fact that we've kept remote, even though people can go back into the workplace. Some of that's been because of the employees and some has been because of the companies. Um, but, you know, some of the, the thought processes, the myths were broken since we've had COVID around that forced some of this. Um, you know, one of the myths was that um, fit the physical workplace is the only way to collaborate. And yet 82% of remote employees believe their technology keeps them connected with their team and manager. Um, engagement levels suffer with remote work. Mm, maybe not. 78% of remote employees say they are, believe they are highly engaged and 72% for on-site employees when they've been surveyed. So the remote ones feel that they're more engaged than the on-site. And remote work has a negative impact on productivity. Again, the remote workers believe 79% of the remote workers and their organization say that it's had little effect on their performance. And 83% of employers say the shift to remote work has been successful. And I know that's not always the case. I know I've had some clients where certain departments that needed a little more hands-on effort in the work they were doing didn't do so well in the remote world. Um, they had to bring them back in and they brought them back in fairly early, like toward the end of 2020. Um, remote work will end when the pandemic is over. 21% um, of employees want full-time 
remote work and they're very adamant about it. They're, I've seen employees quitting because they were being told to come back to the office. 68% of employees want a hybrid environment. And I think that's where most companies are trying to go when possible. And 11% of employees want to work full-time on site. One of the things that I had run across in talking with some people is that it was funny. I, I did a presentation for a bunch of C-level, well, oh, you know, CEOs um, for companies of 10 million or more. And one of the things that was coming out of that was that they had found that their younger employees really, really wanted to be in the office, even though they had more technology skills a lot of times than the older employees. The older employees really loved working remotely, but the younger employees had a good thought on this. They said that when you pull, you know, some of the people, and I'm not saying old necessarily in age, but in experience. Um, so when you pull out some of those much more experienced people out of the workplace, the younger people don't have role models. They don't have mentors. So, and then, you know, the younger people, it was a thought process that they want to be able to move up quickly and they don't feel that they might be seen remotely, that you have to kind of be physically seen with your work and your ideas and stuff like that to be more promotable. And so there's different thought processes going on on where this is going, which is why I think hybrid is probably, you know, closer to what will continue to adapt um, because there is obviously some need at times to have people together. It really helps with company loyalty and um, that connection because you know, no matter how many Zoom meetings you might have, it's not the same as just being more casually connected. All right, then let's see, we're going, yeah, we're just moving right through these following questions, Deb. <laughs> Do you have a policy developed for remote work? Yes or no? And I actually had a question for you, CJ, that someone had submitted. And they asked, is there a minimum number of employees that an employer must have in order to have to create an ergonomic workstation? We have four employees, one of which has always been remote. I think ergonomics is not a company size. It's a risk management policy, you know, to where, I mean, that was one of the, the problems with the remote work is you knew some of these people were at their kitchen table or dining room table, which is about two inches higher than it's supposed to be ergonomically, because then it, it starts hitting your shoulders. So any size company can be hit with a worker's con claim, which is what that would turn into. If now they've got pains in their arms or their shoulders because they're not in an ergonomic work place. So that's why it's important to make sure that if you've got remote people, that you're also looking at what is their home setup. And in the office, you know, that's, that's always been considered but I don't think people think about it enough, and I'll be going through some of that um, later in the webinar here. Awesome. We have about 72% who have voted. Um, maybe if we can get a little closer to 80%, I'll close it out. All right, we're at about 76%, so I will close it. So 40% said yes, and 61% said no to having a work policy. <laughs> All right. So if you're one of those 60% that said no, you definitely need to get one. You know, I know that my policy went from being, you know, maybe less than a third of a page in the employee handbook, and now it's more like two and three pages. Um, because of all the different things now that, that you really have to think about. Because before it was a little more casual, like a manager, oh, I'm going to work from home on Friday. And it was like, oh, okay. and nobody thought about it. So things that you do need to think about now, because the remote work has become more focused in everybody's mind, are those working conditions at home that we were just had that question about. Well, it wasn't necessarily a question at home, but the working conditions at home. Um, employee movement um, in the sense of promotions, you know, performance reviews, things like that. And, you know, even I'll call it paperwork movement because not everything starts off as a digital file. And so what are you doing with the mail that comes in? Things like that. The communication difficulties. There's a lot of people out there, I don't care what age it is, that just have not adapted to the online communication resources that are available. 
And so that makes it much harder because it's a lot harder to do things just by phone or just by Zoom or that kind of stuff. Um, safety and ergonomics plays a role in all of this, basic you know, compliance with employment laws and manager training. So we're gonna kind of go through a lot of these things. When we talk about a written policy, you really do want one. Um, add it to your handbook, or if you don't have a handbook, create a separate policy that employees sign. Um, it needs to avoid discrimination on who gets to be remote if people are wanting it um, versus those who are forced into the offices, which is kind of the language they seem to use. And um, the process of developing a policy is really good for the company because it makes you think through the process and the what ifs. So one of the first things to think about is the eligibility. In the last couple of years, it's been a forced factor because of COVID. But let's pretend COVID's not a, a factor. What would cause your company to allow someone to be remote? In the old days, I'll call it pre-COVID, my rule personally was that I wanted to see an employment work on site for at least six months so I could see what, you know, first off, make sure they knew what they were doing. I could see what their, you know, work ethics were, how their performance was, how their productivity was, things like that, you know, to decide whether or not I felt comfortable with now having them out of sight, essentially. But you're looking at everything, you know, potentially from minimum length of employment, which is what I just spoke to, performance, you know, maybe you've got people that would otherwise be eligible, but they're not a great performer, and you'd rather have your eyes on them and have them in-house. Um, the position, some people will only let like managers and above work remotely occasionally. And what is their home situation? Do they actually have the capability of having a home office of some sort? Um, you need to consider the approval process. What is? What are the steps you want? I mean, one thing that's come through with COVID is that people have moved around like crazy. Oh, I'm gonna you know, move to Texas to go live with my family. Um, you know, oh, you know, I had one client where, okay, this employee we just found out and moved a month ago to Belgium. How do we deal with this? And so there's a lot of things that you want to put in place because you don't want that. People thinking they, they have the right to move around and still maintain their employment. It just doesn't work in some situations. So you need a process. Um, I like having a trial period. Okay, you know, we'll try this remote. You know, we've got it set up. We'll try it for a couple months and then we're going to reevaluate and see whether or not this is working for you remotely. So, and that becomes a person to person kind of a thing. And you absolutely need something in there that talks about rescinding the approval to work remotely. There was a, you know, because there's been a huge problem in the last year trying to get employees back into the office and, you know, when they needed to. And a lot of times we've had to put an absolute deadline if you aren't back at work on this date, it will be considered a resignation. And, you know, because it wasn't designed to be a remote position, we don't want to keep it to be a remote position, or it's just not working out well. So you have to make it clear that you have the right as a company to pull that back at any time. Then we've got the workspace. What you don't want is something like this picture. And that's what you see a lot of. And that's one of the reasons, not, not the only reason, certainly, but one of the reasons that we were hearing about people not wanting to come back in the workplace, it's like, well, I don't have childcare anymore, or I don't have an extra car anymore. You know, they, they kind of adapted to the person working from home and got rid of all the things that normally they would need in order to work. They no longer had the childcare. Now, some of that wasn't their fault because of COVID, but in a COVID free, or at least now, there are childcare centers. And I'm hearing a lot of that to where, what you know is that the person the, you know that was working from home was also taking care of their children instead of hiring childcare for that, and so that means that they're not being able to focus on their work. You know, how many times have you been on a Zoom meeting and you've heard you know the pets running around in the background or the children running around in the background? And um, one of the things to consider is that most employees before COVID didn't even think about having a workspace at home. And like I said, I, you know, I had that client that was dropping off little, you know, kind of those old typing table kind of size um, in order to have somebody, you know, have something at the right height for their laptops. And, but that's part of it is that people don't think about that, you know, when they buy a house or rent an apartment, they didn't think, oh, this will be my office. 
um, you know, they just said, this is what we need to live in. And so a lot of times they're not set up to be a quiet place to work or even distraction free. You want the person to be able to dedicate their work time to work. Um, and to be available during the scheduled work time. So you need to be very careful about that and to make sure that all the digital and paper files in their work spot is secure. And, you know, and that's things that people don't think about or haven't thought about in the last couple of years. But this is why, you know, as you're moving forward and looking at more permanent remote spots, you need to actually make sure that you're set up for that so that it doesn't cause other problems. Because you certainly don't want the kids coming in and messing up with, you know, an attorney's papers that they've got laid out on their desk, things like that, you know, and stuff like that. so. And the digital files, you know, it's like I've seen where somebody, you know, had their cat on their desk while they work, but then one time they, they moved away from their computer and the cat walked across the computer and did a major screw up with, you know, just hitting the keys as they walked across. Not something you kind of think about. <laughs> and, um, you know, once I saw nothing, I was on a, a webinar and the person giving it was talking and actually had a glass of wine or something red and their dog came up and hit their elbow and it spilled it all over their laptop. And it didn't matter what the liquid was, but there was now liquid all over their laptop. So these are things that you have to kind of give some thought to. When you've got the people working from home, it's not just, you know, we don't have to worry about it anymore. And you have to talk about who's paying. This is critical. Um, you know, most of the time, well, IRS, and I know some states, I know California is a big one, who says it should never cost the employee a single penny to work for you. And IRS is on there, so you've got the federal to start with, and then you've got various states that push it harder on it. And so you're looking at, you know, a computer, a webcam, if you expect them to do Zoom meetings, perhaps an external monitor because the laptop the screen isn't big enough for the type of work they do, potentially a printer or a scanner. Um, you've got to look at their home internet speed. A lot of people, I mean, I actually run across employees now who tell me they never, they didn't have internet at home. And so they had to actually get it or they had to, to go to a higher level and pay more for the internet to get it at a speed that was needed in order to do the work. You're looking at the furniture, um, a cell or, you know, phone or a desk phone or a headset. You got office supplies, you've got, you know, a virtual private network potentially, and you've got employees now asking for part of their rent because now you're making them use part of their apartment for work. So when you look at who pays, um, you know, like I said, IRS, and I know California would absolutely say you pay for all of it. However, they have given some caveats, you know, to where it's like, okay, if someone is asking to to work from home, not you're requiring it like a COVID. If they're asking, then you're assuming they've got some kind of an office setup. It may not be a whole room, but at least it's a corner of the room, something where they've got it, they've got it set up so it's ergonomic and they've got the furniture. And so the furniture is like the one thing you probably shouldn't need to consider. And if you do need to, if they're asking for furniture, then I'm, I'm thinking that they're not ready to work remotely. Um, but computer, webcams, things like that, you need to make sure the employee has everything they need, including software, which I didn't even mention here, software to do the work. Because if you're giving the person who's working from home less equipment, shall we say, than what you've got in the office that they could be using, then you have somehow slowed down their work. Now, in some cases with the computer, the webcam, the, the internet, stuff like that, um, I know it's not, you know, this is where you have to think about it. And I don't know if it's popped up in other states, but California has actually looked at this a little deeper. They actually had a lawsuit and a judge came in and said, you know, even if it's not costing that employee to more, let's say I've got a laptop, I've got a cell phone, I've got high enough internet speed. So now you're thinking, cool, I don't have to do you anything. Well, there was a judge in California who said, no, that's not true. The company is still receiving a benefit from the employee having those things. And therefore you should reimburse the employee for your business use of their personal property. 
And I mean, this is a big thing in California. And so other states, you know, could certainly be doing similar things, maybe just haven't had the lawsuits and to ask about it. And, um, you know, because even on a cell phone, if, you know, it came up because of a cell phone and it was an unlimited plan and they're going, well, it doesn't cost them anything, but the judge said, you're as a company getting a benefit because you don't have to provide that. And so you should reimburse the employee a reasonable amount for use of their stuff. And so keep in mind that kind of concept because like I said, IRS is certainly gonna think if it ever come up, but I don't think IRS gets into the employment law matters. Um, it's just a general you know, thing for them. Um, but if you're in a state with a little more, a few more employment laws like California, keep in mind, this is a big you know, conversation piece there. And I think it helps to have it clearly thought through what you will provide and what you won't provide. And safety, there's that ergonomic thing. Um, even before COVID, I had a client who would ask employees who asked, wanted to work remotely to take a picture of their home setup because they wanted to make sure they weren't gonna be looking at workers' comp claims. Because yes, you send that person to work from home, they have a workers' comp claim. If they trip over the toy, whether it's a kid's toy or a dog toy that's sitting right by where they were working and they get up and they slip on it and they fall and they break an arm. That's a workers' comp thing because they were working. So you want to make sure that it's something where it's kind of this little isolated thing and, um, you know, that doesn't have hazards, that has the ergonomic, you know, chair versus, you know, table height, things like that. And, you know, as just a side point, keep in mind, your workers' compensation does touch all of those people working remotely. So if you've got employees who have moved out of state from where your office is located because they moved home with their parents during COVID and stuff like that, you needed to make sure that your workers' comp policy covered the people in the other states and that it actually lists those states and separates them out because the, you know, the policy needs to make sure, it, you know, you always need, I don't care where you're working, you need a workers' comp policy covering you. I know the temp agencies used to, um, I knew one, an owner of one temp agency, and she said her workers' comp policy for all of those temps that she sends out there does not cover working from home or personal spaces. It, they ha she had to put make sure her, her temps went to a commercial site because that's what her workers' comp policy stated. So make sure that you're, you're actually covered properly with workers comp for these people because otherwise you've got a whole lot of other problems coming up if you haven't checked into that so let's move on to our next polling question then what percentage of your employees will you keep working remotely permanently we've got actually quite a few questions for you Fiji so I'm going to go ahead and all right Start off with a couple. Um, I know California has rules around reimbursing employees for work-related expenses. What's the guidance for how much should be reimbursed? <laughs> I talked with attorneys about this and they say there is no specific guidance. It, to me, it's more of a negotiation. Um, I've had a client that, that reimbursed for a cell phone as little as $5 for the month because they had to use it very little. Um, others that, you know, um, might do, I've got one client who has very high tech people. And so she pays $50 a month for internet, $35, no, $50 per pay period. So twice a month, so hundred dollars a month for internet because they need a very high speed and a very sturdy one. Um, and then $35 a month for cell phone reimbursement. And so it, it's more to the point of coming up with something that sounds like it's a fair amount and usually then you just kind of say, it's like if an employee comes back and says, I use my cell phone almost entirely for work, this isn't enough. Then you negotiate individually, I think, with that person if they've got a job that requires much heavier use of, we'll call it a piece of equipment than maybe other employees do. And some of it's gonna be based on their position, you know, just what is it that they're doing? Um, you're not expected to pay 100% of it, but if you think about it, if they're doing work from home, um, you know, I have a home office myself. And so when I look at how much time I spend on the internet for work versus the freedom, you know, my personal time on the internet, 
I should be charging, you know, my company at least 50% of my internet costs. So you mostly you just try to be fair and, you know, not, not skimp too much, but to try and be fair with it. And most employees seem to be fine with something because I don't think a lot of them are actually expecting it. Awesome. All right, we have a few other questions. I think maybe we'll go, we'll wait until the next polling question to address them. Yeah, so I'm gonna close this okay. polling question. And the results are that 18% say 0%, 35% say 25%, 17% say 50%, 19% say 75%, and 15% say 100%. So you can see, you know, the difference in these polling questions and the way the percentages have gone that the companies have adapted to it. And, you know, and so a lot of it, you know, it's worked out well. Some I know haven't, but others have worked out great from both sides. And, um, you know, and I think that the danger zone always is that a company thinks that they can save money and they need to be very careful about that. They might be able to save on some office space if they get around to having to, you know, a, you know, come up to a new leasing period or something like that, but you can't just send people off without spending any money on them and think that's fine. So now let's talk about compliance because every state, whether it's just following federal law or some state laws, there's a lot of you know employment law compliance. Timekeeping, if you've got hourly employees out there, how are you tracking the timekeeping? Are you able to do that? I know um, I've got clients where they can actually see, you know, remotely they can go and, and see when people have been on their computer or logged into their work website, stuff like that. Um, you know, you wanna be careful about your wage and hour laws for, our, for the hourly people. Um, you know, it's like in California, we have this very strict meal break rule and um, you need to make sure that they're still being able to clock out and back in for their meal breaks. Um, every state has overtime, whether it's the daily, like California, or the weekly, like most states. Um, so you need to make sure that, you know, they're not just doing the work, that they're still following the schedule, basically. Leave of absence management and coverage. I don't know if it becomes any trickier, but I think in some cases it does, because I think it's harder for other people to pick up where when someone's on the leave, um, when it's all remote, because you don't, you don't necessarily kind of like see the work piling up per se. Um, but you have to consider that, you know, what's different about that. Even with COVID right now, they're, you know, they've got these rules about, well, you know, you don't have to worry about a quarantine if the person's working from home anyhow and not around any other coworkers. So it's kind of gotten, you know, a little bit confused that while well, the person's at home, they can do all these things, but they're still gonna have sick days. Even if they're working from home, they're still gonna have leaves of absence. So you have to decide how you're gonna manage that, um, that and even more importantly, how you're gonna manage the coverage when someone's not just sitting at a desk nest next to them that could pick up on some of it. Posters, we all have to post those employment law posters on the wall. Um, and it's funny because California just passed a law that allowed you to also share them digitally, which is funny because uh, face it, companies have been doing that for a long time as long as they've had remote workers. But, you know, it is important to remember that, you know, if you're not just buying a poster for every remote person out there, you need a way to do it. There are often in every state, I believe, the required posters available. What I do for myself, because I work as a consultant to make sure that we've got the right posters for like California, is that we I actually buy a poster each year and then make sure that I'm finding the correct PDFs that go with that poster so that when I'm sending out to remote employees, I've got the correct ones. And so keep in mind that anything that you're legally required to post on the wall in your office, every remote employee needs access to that information. Um, location of worker. So make sure that your payroll, I've run across this a lot. Um, you know, the person moved out of state or, you know, they're hiring people from state because gosh, we don't need to worry about an office anymore. And they're forgetting that they've got to get a state ID for payroll purposes for every state they've got an employee. And that slows down the payroll process because some states, I swear, it's like some you get almost automatically on the, you know, digitally when you are online with them. Others, they're like, only doing snail mail and it'll be like three to four weeks before we'll get you your ID number. 
um, things like that, but to make sure, you know, you've got the payroll set up to pay taxes in the correct states. Um, you've got, and keep in mind that the health insurance needs to have coverage. Um, I know my office is in San Diego and the San Diego County has so much that's HMO related. It's, you hardly ever have to even think about PPOs. But as soon as you go outside of that area, like when I worked up in San Francisco, you know, there weren't, back when I was working up in San Francisco, there were, the only thing that was available other than a PPO was a Kaiser and it was across the bay in Oakland. And so nobody would go over there. And, you know, and it was just, it's, you have to think about this, you know, where is your insurance providing coverage? You know, is it the same coverage now equal? I should say not the same, but is it equal coverage for employees? Um, you know, and looking at, all that and to keep in mind that if you if you're in California but you have, well actually I'll turn it around if your office was in Texas and your employees were mostly in Texas but now you've got people scattered around and you've got one in California that California employee you have to follow California law for that in person and I got to tell you if you're not used to California law it is you know horrendous we've got many many more employment laws than any other state it's you know like I said we've got this weird little meal break rule we've got daily overtime there's all kinds of things to consider when you put an employer have one in California and there's other states Washington is becoming almost as bad as California in that sense so you have to look at where your employees are because you're going to be subject to the laws in those states because and, and it can be very tricky because like California, when someone is fired, you have to have a check in your, you, you've got to be able to give them the money that day. You can't wait for direct deposits, things like that, you know, and so you need to know what those laws are in any of the states where you have employees, because it can get kind of messy if you don't. I mean, you know, I think the companies that are in California have an advantage there because if you follow California law, it's hard to go wrong elsewhere. So it's, you know, it's more like a break if you have employees in another location to where it's like, oh my gosh, we have five days to get that final paycheck to them and, and things like that. But that's something to consider is to look and see, make sure that you're following all the laws. Different paid sick leaves these days are part of that, you know, because a lot of states now have paid sick leave and sometimes it's just a city within a state. And because you know, even in California, we've got a California paid sick leave law, and then there's 30 lo local laws and um, that are different and, and always a higher rate than the state amount. So you need to really pay attention to where your employees are landing when they're working remotely because they don't think twice about the ability to move. But that's why you need a process for eligibility for moves and stuff like that in order to make sure that you've got the back end covered. Um, so with remote management, you've got to update your processes and your policies to, you know, look at the new technology you're needing for communication and workflow, um, you know, and because it's, I think it's still impossible to be 100% remote in the sense that you have no paper. Paper comes in the mail. You've still got somebody, whether it's the CEO of the company, wherever that mail is going, it still needs to be open and digitized and sent out. So you need something that talks, you know, that speaks to that kind of movement. You need to train your managers. Most managers weren't trained to manage remotely. And when I've, I've had clients where even before COVID were definitely open to remote and, but every time they allow a manager to work like three days remotely, they found that that department went downhill because there wasn't as much communication and oversight as when they were all working together. And so you need to kind of look at that. And some of that's just a person who, who doesn't do it correctly or doesn't know how. So you're looking at, you know, their communication skills. Some people are less comfortable speaking over a Zoom meeting or, you know, just on the phone and, you know, versus being able to say something when you're just walking up next to them. Um, there's new software that managers need to be able to know how to do and even help their people with. And um, you're looking too at the flexibility to adapt to what is going on with remote workers. Um, a lot of times if a remote worker, you know, let's, you know, we've all had employees with personal issues going on. 
And a lot of times that can affect the workplace because, you know, and some people I know when they've had a bad home life kind of thing going on, they love coming into work because it gives them a break from it. It's like their little oasis to come into the office and only think about work for a while. But now if they're all at home all the time, you've got a whole different personal life going on back there. And, you know, and so you've got to learn how to manage employees that are going through some of that stuff. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's some of the concerns, younger employees, you know, that need the, the, the mentoring and, you know, not a word, you know, the words from experienced people, they worry they won't be promoted if they're not seen physically. And, um, and they're worried that they won't have these more experienced employees in the office to help train them and give them, you know, some clues of how to move move forward faster, how to do this work instead of, you know, recreating the wheel. And one of the big concerns I know, and I, you know, is a lack of social interaction often affects mental health of employees and their loyalty. If all you ever do is talk to coworkers on Zoom, it's, it's not the same. You know, if you've worked inside an organization where you're you're friendly with your coworkers and occasionally go out for lunch or maybe out for drinks afterwards, it's harder to do that remotely, you know? And it, you know, so a lot of people think, well, gosh, if I'm just, you know, working on the computer all day, it doesn't matter who I work for. And so you really have to look at, at almost team building kind of things that you, you know, sales, Teams have always had that kind of thing because the sales reps have always been remote and working out and about. And, you know, and so that's why companies that have sales teams are very focused on creating those team building things and doing like quarterly, you know, regional meetings or, or nationwide annual meetings for those sales reps to give them that connection. So you need to now bring that to the regular office environment. And how do you do it with that? I mean, I've had clients that even in the first year of COVID, you know, in, in 2020, we're still doing a, a company picnic, but now they had gone and they'd actually rented a bunch of tables and they made sure they were like six to eight feet apart, but people could still talk to each other and see their families and stuff like that. You know, they've gotten creative. And so you need to think about that. And, you know, and communication. You need to develop some communication protocols. Um, you know, we've all seen how texting has, you know, kind of brought down good writing skills and grammar down to, you know, acronyms and things like that. And even emails have always had a problem. But, you know, when you've got communication that's remote, um, you know, you have to give some thought to how to do it with remote employees. You can't, you know, just default. I know I've had... <laughs> company owners are like, well, can I just like email them that they're fired? And it's like, not really, or, you know, prefer not my preference, but you have to kind of consider how things are taken because when you put things, we've always known that when you put things in writing, it can be easily misunderstood because there's not the facial expression or the tonal inflection from your voice to give them a clue as to what you really meant. You know, I mean, there's been a rule out there for a long time, never do an email in all caps because it's perceived as you yelling at them. There's all these weird little things like that that now you have to consider when you're working with remote. Um, as I mentioned, the paper movement, you know, where, who's, who's getting the paper, how's it being moved, things like that. Um, you know, and what's appropriate and secure and you've got software and apps and, you know, that kind of thing. So you're looking, a lot of clients I know that have remote, they're saying, well, everything's online now. But do you know that that's not actually a good answer? <laughs> because you know, it doesn't help communication necessarily. One of my early clients was a company that was started by a 19 year old. And it was now a nationwide company. He had employees in, I think at the time I started working with him, in probably eight different states. And um, he, you know, everything, so much was remote. They had a base in San Diego, but, you know, only maybe 15 of their 35 employees at the time were working in that, in that thing. Company meetings were done by a conference call because we didn't really have Zoom at that point, um, things like that. And it was funny because I had mentioned to him, he started looking as the company started growing like crazy. Um, he was looking for a COO to kind of take over things. And he didn't get me when I said, you know, it's good to have someone local to you. 
and he says, you know, it was it was like twice he hired someone like in Washington D.C. and he was in San Diego, and it didn't work out. And I tried to convince him that what I had seen over the years when I worked inside offices was I saw a lot of decisions and policies made and business done just by some of the C-level people walking by another one's office and say, you know, I had this thought here, and they get to talking about it, and you know, and the next thing you know, there's a new product line or this or that, and this guy it was so funny he said well we have chat and it's like okay i can see we're talking on two completely levels there he did he'd never experienced what it was like inside of an office so it was hard for him to understand that but he eventually took my advice hired a ceo and had them in the office mm -hmm. with him and it's worked out beautifully she ended up getting part of the company and runs it for him so he can be the creative which is what he really is and doing that and, you know, so you have to kind of look at all forms of communication that's going on and to, you know, look at not only what you're using for software and apps and things like that, but to make sure every employee and, you know, is trained on how to use them. Because there's nothing worse than going into new software and not knowing how to do it. And I mean, even, you know, Deb and I, for this webinar, we did this practice, you know, swapping it over to me before, you know, the, the session started because if you're not using something for a while, it's easy to forget. And if you've never been trained on it, it's really easy not to know what to do or where the shortcuts are. And, you know, and to know how to help avoid isolation. You've got extroverts out there. There are a lot of people who are extroverts. They need someone to be around, you know, or they need to be around other people. And mm -hmm. so they're not gonna like remote. It's not going to work out on a long-term basis for them. They will look elsewhere if they can't get that interaction that they need. And, you know, and, and I mentioned before, loyalty may be lost because, again, you don't necessarily, you know, people are feeling isolated. That's always been a problem with remote people. And, you know, having COVID, you know, only kind of brought it out more because with COVID, then there were additional mental health issues of people that didn't do well working by themselves and having COVID as a strain on top of that. So you need to kind of consider what are your performance expectations? Ideally, they're the same as when you're in the facility, you know, when they were in the office, um, you know, that you expect them to be available during the regular work times, you expect their production to be the same. Um, you want to have a policy that sets up the meeting protocols. You know, most of the time you want them to have what would be considered normal normal business attire that you'd have in the office for your online meetings. Um, you want to, you know, maybe set up in-person meetings. I've got clients to where, all right, if you're going to meet with a client personally, you know, face-to-face, -face, it needs to be in our office. It can't be at your home. It can't be at a hotel. It needs to be in our office. And if you're doing online meetings, you need to look professional. You know, it can be from the waist up because that's all you see most of the time on an online meeting. But some of these Online meetings have gone in directions. We've heard some horror stories where somebody, you know, had their, they were using like a Zoom meeting on their phone and basically kind of forgot it was still on when they went to the restroom, um, stuff like that, because they were at home. They didn't think about the fact that they were still on camera. Um, you know, all wonderful little things that can happen, you know, when you're doing the online meeting. So you need to kind of put some protocols in there and you need to have methods. Start looking at what you've got for methods for tracking performance of remote workers. And it should be basically the same way you track, um, you know, how your in, you know, in-house people are doing. But, you know, to look at that, are they, you know, and that's kind of why I said before COVID, my preference was they worked in-house for a while. So we could kind of see what their performance level was because if they needed help a lot, I don't want to put them out there as a remote employee. I want to bring them in-house so that they can get the help they need and get up to the level we need. Security, you know, most of most companies have some level of IT, whether it's an outsourced IT department, inside, whatever. But, you know, with remote workers, it becomes a much, much bigger challenge. Um, I know I saw a study, gosh, when COVID was first starting, and they were saying that home computers are basically much more easily hacked than business computers, like at a, at a work at an office, because at an office you think through those things. You've had your IT people set up, you know, special lines and stuff to help protect, you know, and 
you know, and you've got all kinds of, you know, protection software that is installed on every, you know, office computer, things like that. But um, home computers and internets are 40% more hackable than an office one. So companies need to consider that. What about the unattended computers? Somebody gets up and they're going to like, oh, I'm going to go in the kitchen and, and make some coffee. Next thing you know, they've got, oh, this happened and that happened. And now their computer's sitting there unattended for two hours. Or, oh, you know, I forgot I left it on. Now I've got people coming over. So you need to set, you know, rules. My, my rule is that if you have to get up for any reason from your desk, you log off. You don't have anything in there, you know, open that is considered, you know, confidential. Um, you make sure the passwords are secure. They're not like taped to the bottom of their laptop, um, you know, things like that. You've got the rules about whether if they're going over to the, to the Starbucks or the local coffee shop to work there for a while. You know, that's usually a shared hotspot. And, you know, everybody says you do not use that with confidential stuff where they could read. See, even if it's just to get your password entered and to log online to a confidential site, the fact that you use their Internet to log in could be hacked. So, you know, there's a lot of rules companies are setting up to whether they're saving to your hard drive or you always have everything saved to the cloud. Um, you know, where where is that information kept? Because if you're using their personal laptop, you don't have any right to go in there and pull stuff off. So if you if you send them a company laptop to use, then it's just like, you know, shut it down, send it back to us. Otherwise, you need to set up some rules about clearing off the company information if they're going to leave, you know, if if the separating from you for you know some reason. Um, so there's all kinds of things, you know, the same kind of security things you've got with computers at work, but now it becomes a little trickier because you're trusting the people remotely to do what you told them to do, and you don't have any oversight on that. Like IT, you know, if you've got an IT department, they can see everywhere, you know, an employee is looking online, what they're doing, how much time they're spending, but you got, you don't have that control in, you know, when it's at home on their personal computer. So you need to kind of think through that a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we got a last polling question here. Do you feel you have the HR knowledge needed for remote work? Yes, no, or could implement, but not enough to develop policy or procedures. And while we've got others answering that question, I'll go over a couple of questions we currently have, which by the way, we do have quite a few just a heads up to everybody. We'll try to get to them at the end, but I think that it's, it might be something where um, we'll have to have CJ address these questions in an email afterward, okay? Um, so the right. question is, if remote work is allowed and employees move outside of the state, are you familiar with companies indicating they now have new tax reporting and filing requirements in addition to potentially new labor laws. I think I've heard this, and this is probably in reference to a previous topic as it was asked quite a while ago. So. Yeah. Yes. You know, cause that's why you have to sign up um, with, to get a state ID number in every state where we have an employee, because you are going to have like unemployment and you're going to have state taxes that may go to, you know, both company. Cause like, you know, how when you do payroll, there's federal taxes and there's state taxes that come up. So those state taxes, you've got to be signed in and yes, you're going to end up, having your CPA or whoever is doing your taxes, having to do taxes for you in different states based on what you've got going on there. I mean, I'm not a tax person, but you definitely need to check with your CPA on that. Okay, we can maybe ask one more. Um, as an employer, do we have the right to go into someone's home to assess their at-home workspace? If they have requested to work remotely, I guess you could, but you would still want, I would, I would make it part of the policy that if you want to work remotely, here's our rules for it. You need to allow someone to come in and look at your work setup. Um, you know, you might also allow, I mean, it's part, you know, it's like one of those trust factors, you know, you could say, just send us a picture of it or, you know, get on a Zoom on your phone because you can get a Zoom app on there and walk through your house for us and show us where you're going to be working. Something like that. So I'm, I'm hesitant to say you, you want a person to go into their home, um, but if you make it part of your policy, you certainly could. If you're only allowing people where it's like, we want to see what the setup is personally and double check it, 
then if you make it part of your policy, then it's just whether or not they're wanting to work remote bad enough to let you in. Results of the polling question was 57% said yes, and 37% said could not implement, but not enough to develop policy or procedures. Or, I'm sorry, could implement. Yeah, I said that correctly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, I think, you know, part of it is you just think through. I know you're going to get a copy of, you know, these slides and stuff like that. So take them one by one of all the different topics I brought up and and um, you know, work with management on there. And if you write any, if you have written policies for your employee handbook, it's the same kind of thing. You just have to think it through, be clear, and not make it overly complicated um, in order to do that. Or hire an HR consultant to do it for you. You know, based on whatever it is you're trying to do. So, tips for success. Obviously, you need to invest in the right technology. A lot of times, whatever you are using in the office isn't necessarily going to adapt well for remote workers. Um, you know, and that's what you need to look at and see if there's better because you do want to enhance the communication software, particularly because you want to encourage that back and forth um, easily. And to do that, and and you know, and I'll throw this out there because I didn't mention it before. You want to remind employees that whatever they put in writing can often last forever. So don't think that you can make some negative comment about some other employee and not have them figure it out. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like they out there online. You know, it can come back to haunt you. So people, you know, when you talk about you know what you can put in those chat screens and things like that. They should be careful. Um, definitely provide management training, not only on the software that you're using now for the remote, but to give them some tools and think through. It's like, how can they be a better manager for these people that they're not in front of every day? Because they might, you might have somebody who is extremely supportive in person in the office, but finds it difficult to figure out how to make that work remotely. So look at that, you know, develop an in-depth policy depending on how much, you know, there's some companies that are, you know, we saw the numbers, some that are definitely going back in-house that might allow a few people remotely. So sometimes maybe you don't need much of one if it's just, okay, they can work remotely, you know, for, a, you know, a specific period of time for this reason. Um, and then learn how to track and measure results so that you are actually being fair to everybody and not just assuming because they're working remotely and, um, you know, they may have, it may be that they're not able to adapt well from their side for remote work, that they actually need the consistency around them of an office environment in order to be a good producer. So it works from both sides. It's not only, you know, your managers working with them, but some people, even though as much as they might like it, maybe just don't, it's not the best work environment for them. So you have to kind of figure that out and think about that when you're putting this all together. And, you know, as always, whenever you have someone who's working remotely, prepare, be always prepared for resistance to get them back in the office. Um, you know, and so I would say always make sure that your, your policy at the very least says that we can call you back at any time for any reason. And it's like the old with or without notice type of thing. You know, but usually you want to give them some notice. Ideally, if you've got somebody who's out there remotely and you know they have some personal circumstances like childcare to think about um, that might change if they're having to come back in the office, give them some time. You know, it's like, okay, two weeks or a month, something like that. Plenty of advance notice so they can't say, I can't do it, um, you know, to figure that out. And right on time. Um, I can stay on for a few minutes if we have want to kind of carve through a few of those questions, if you've got some that you think would be good to go through, Deb. Sure, I have quite a few questions. Um, if everybody would like to, you know, stay and listen, they're welcome to do so. Um, we, will, we will get through as many as we can. And um, yeah, it's, it's completely up to everybody at this point. So. I will start with the first one, and I'm sorry, I don't know which topic this is referring to, but it said, can we dictate the hours that the employee is working? Absolutely. You do in the office. Why wouldn't you remotely? In fact, I would, I, that's one of my things I want to insist on. Um, you know, the one thing that I think some companies I've introduced to co some companies is what I call the core hours. Um, because if you've got people in other states or other time zones, mostly, 
if it's all in the same time zone, then you 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 know you stick with your office hours. There's no reason that you need to change that. And but if you've got people in different time zones, then you might want to consider. Okay, we need you to be available from you know ten to two, like Pacific time, you know wherever you are, and then you can put your the rest of your eight hours either before or after that. Um, because we need time to know when we can schedule meetings and things like that. If you just let everybody be, okay, you're, you're all eight to five, but you're in different time zones, you've got, you know, a big beginning and an end of a day there for some people where nobody else is working. So you need to kind of consolidate it in some fashion, but you need to make it easy to work and make sure employees understand this isn't, you know, live in and come to work in your pajamas thing because you've gone remote. This is, you know, you're still having to be at work or, you know, available at eight, um, just like you were in the office or whatever time, you know, you normally do. Okay, next question. If they have a choice to work from home, do we still need to reimburse in California? They have an office with everything they need, but if they prefer to, um, they need, I'm sorry, they have an office with everything they need, but if they prefer to work from home. Actually, you don't. It's the the requirement, at least it seems to be what we're doing now, but the, you know, there's, I will say it's a 50-50 here. On one hand, that it is said that if um, the employee can come into the office, use your laptop, use your phone, stuff like that, you don't have to reimburse them. However, then I know I will find an attorney that would say, but the fact that you allowed them to work remotely means that, you know, you should reimburse them. So it's one of those things where you have to judge, you know, what kind of risk you're willing to take on whether or not that could become an argument. that due to COVID, they are free to return to the office, what are we required to do? Okay, this COVID is like a three hour webinar. Um, I would say you just make sure, you know, you're following whatever the local laws are. You know, a lot of, most states have a public health department. I know in California, we've got Cal OSHA and you've got OSHA and you've got CDC. I think you want to look at that. If people are ready to come back to the office and or you want them back, you just need to ensure, make sure the office has, is, you're following the normal safety guidelines that we've been having to follow for in office things. It has mellowed down, you know, you can see that on the CDC as far as some of that, but you know, I, I can't go into that because it's, there's just so many pieces of it. Make sure you're following the normal safety COVID guidelines. If an employee has a desk in the office but works from home part of the time, do we need to duplicate things like posters? If you actually, if that employee truly is in, the, I would say if the employee is in the office once a week, the rule is on the posters is it must be easily accessible for them to, re, to view. So in the office, you you know, they know they're in there, but if they're spending the majority of their time at home, I would say you do want to duplicate it then. How do we ensure our employees are working and stopping at the proper intervals? Let's say they get in a groove at home and want to work 10 hours today and tomorrow want to work five hours. I'm concerned about overtime and the like. Yeah, I, I mean, again, it's the same, you know, kind of take it out of your mind that they're working from home. You have them follow your same policies. No, you know, you need pre-approval to work overtime. If you're in a state with, you know, like California that has the daily overtime after eight hours, um, then, you know, you say no. You, you know, you work your normal eight hours. You can't work overtime. And you make sure they're clocking in and out on something, whether it's a spreadsheet that they're putting in their actual times. And I always want to use their actual times, not just eight to five, eight to five, eight to five, because that will never help you if you ever get a dispute over their hours. It needs to be their actual time. Um, I know a lot of companies have moved to um, like a, a an app on the phone or can be used on the computer, things like that. And um, but no, you you still dictate hours if it's an hourly employee. If it's an exempt employee, you obviously don't have the right to dictate quite as much, but you definitely need them to be available because if they're planning to only work five days one day, that might hamper other stuff that needs their attention on that day. So I'd say you know, there's no reason to completely change your rules for those remote employees. As far as I'm concerned, you know, they go out remotely, you should, it's, it's 
think of them like they've, they're working now on a different floor of the building you're in and you just don't go up and see them all the time, but you're going to expect them to be there if you contact them. And I have a request um, to see a sample or a template policy checklist, or if you have a resource for that, maybe we could include that in the follow-up email, if you know of any good ones. Um, is that no, I mean, I've got my policy, but I've not seen... I, I can't say that I've actually seen a checklist necessarily. I frankly, I think the, you know, because the stuff I put in my policy are things that are on these slides. So I think the slides actually work as a good checklist for you to go through and just see. It's like, okay, have I thought about this, that, the next thing. All right. And, so, and I have another one that says, would it be wise to add a clause that remote work may change due to public health orders? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, because there's, you know, it's like the remote work. I mean, I'd be careful, you know, because if somebody's saying, hey, I'm working at home, why should that bother, you know, why should that affect me? So make sure you're clear on what that means, you know, that it's, that, you know, whether or not you're able to work remotely or not may depend on, on our office situation, given what the safety rules are at the moment. Well, we've actually made it to the last question as some were um, somewhat similar to each other. So I think we've addressed pretty much every type of question. So here's the last one. If an employee chooses to work from home while recovering from COVID instead of using PTO, is the employer required to reimburse them for their internet or other work related to expenses? You know, I could see, because I've known a lot of these. I could see some crafty, you know, employee side attorney coming up with that, but I don't think so, you know, because most of the time it's, you know, I think it's the, the bigger thing would be, you know, is are they able to work, you know, because if they're just going through a quarantine period um, and are preferring to work instead of taking like sick time or something like, or they're using their PTO, I've not heard of anybody trying to get, um, reimbursements for a very short term thing like that. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. We will send information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. Thank you, CJ, for your time and expertise today. We hope all the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of their time. Be sure to join us on January 25th for Office Ergonomics for Remote Workers. Thank you and have a safe day. Thanks, Deb.